Sarah Parks, you can go ahead and start the live stream, I think, if you're ready. Oh, never mind. She's on it. Thank you. So we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes um, for our um, presentation. We have Greg Olson and Lance Foster here, as well as Jackie Lewin from the Oregon California Trails Association. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the Iowa tribe today and uh, resiliency and uh, sustainability during these um, interesting times. If you're joining us on the Zoom, a uh, couple of things. Please let us know where you're coming from. We like to see that. Um, I also would encourage you, if you have questions, to uh, leave those questions in the chat as we're going through the presentation. We're going to have everyone muted uh, during the talk, and then we'll have some time to answer questions at the end. So if you just go ahead and type those questions in the chat, we can go through them um, as we get to the end. Um, also, for those of you who are joining us on Facebook, if you want to type your questions in the comments, we will ask them of uh, Greg and Lance and, and try to address those as well. So welcome to all of you um, on the Zoom, as well as all of you who are joining us live on Facebook. Um, I'm Sarah Wilson and the Executive Director of the St. Joseph Museums. Uh, we'll be starting in just one minute. Excuse me, Sarah. Yeah. I'm looking to see that it's coming in on my Facebook page. I'm not seeing that so that I can share that. Can you give me a hint? Sure. Um, I'm looking right now. Um, it is on the St. Joseph Museum Facebook page. So if you go to our St. Joseph Museum Facebook page, Jackie, um, you should be able to find that link and share it. Okay, I see it. <laughs> I see it. Okay. Very good. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I, I see that we have lots of people jumping on, um, but it is 1.30 and I like to be prompt. Uh, my name is Sarah Wilson. I'm the Executive Director of the St. Joseph Museums. And um, I'm actually joined today with Jackie Lewin, who is our former director um, and uh, an amazing human being. And I've been so fortunate to follow in her footsteps. And she is the current president of the Gateway chapter of the Oregon California Trails Association. And she had asked us to partner with them to um, put together a presentation with Greg Olson and Lance Foster. Um, Lance and Greg had given a presentation at Highland Community College probably around last year this time, perhaps. Yeah. Last um, November. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, it was a really good presentation. And, and we kind of wanted something that was similar to that, that we could share more broadly in a virtual format um, right now. And so we are joined today um, with Lance Foster, who is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. He is also the, the current vice chair of the tribe. Uh, and, and Lance is also the author of um, The Indians of Iowa, um, is a book that he has offered, uh, as well as many other works that he's done, uh, continuously doing research and a wonderful person. Welcome, Lance. Did you want to say a few words? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I put him on the spot. And then we're also <laughs> fortunate to have Greg Olson, who is um, an independent scholar. Independent scholar, that's right. <laughs> he says um, he was the cur curator of exhibits and special projects for the Missouri State Archives for, um, I think, Greg, 19 years, is that? 19 correct? years, that's right, yeah. Yeah, um, and he's also the author of The Iowa in Missouri, um, Shameless plug. Here we go. There, there's that. <laughs> and, uh, um, Iowa Life, yes. Iowa Life, yeah. Those are the two that you went to. I, do you have the copy of Great Walker with you? Or no, that's not yours. It or is. is. It is mine, it is. yeah. Also, right, the books on Great Walker and Jeffrey, Jeffrey Darinay. Yeah. Um, 
but I don't happen to have, these are just what were on the bookshelf handy. So yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at promoting myself. So I need to be more prepared with that, but yeah. Yeah, I've been working on um, researching and writing about the Iowa's, I guess for 25 years maybe. And that's how I met Lance. I think Lance and I have been communicating about Iowa history for maybe 20 years, Lance. It's been a while anyway. So anyway, I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> I'm so glad to have you and we're very fortunate to have your years of knowledge. So um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen um, and then we can kind of get into uh, the presentation that we've put together. Everybody seeing that okay? Yep, okay. Yeah. So after I left the conversation that um, you guys presented in, in Highland, one of the things that really struck me is the lessons that we can learn from the Iowa today. Um, and, and those lessons in my mind have a lot to do with sustainability and resiliency. Um, and so that's kind of the topic of, of this is kind of looking at the history of the Iowa and, and thinking about how um, we can learn from their history and how does that move us um, forward to our present times and, and how do we plan for the future with that. And I think you both are very knowledgeable on this topic. So I, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, so either one of you um, probably know the sort of the history of, you know, where the Iowa came from and, and the homelands. And so Greg or Lance, jump in and... and Actually, I'll jump in because I have a question for Lance about this. Um, so the story that we usually hear about the origins of the Iowa is that they came from a place that they call Mayashuje, which is around Green Bay, Wisconsin, Red Earth is what that means. And I wanted to ask Lance, um, Lance recently in some research I've been doing, I was reading a book by uh, Louis Burns, who was Osage and a historian. And he, he mentioned something about the uh, Iowa's migrating to the Mississippi Valley down the Ohio River with the Osages and the Degean Sioux, that the Jouere Sioux and people and the Degean Sioux and people um, maybe originated rather than the east, Western Great Lakes, maybe more in the Southern Central Great Lakes. And I wanted to know if you'd ever heard anything about that. That was a new one for me. Well, I mean, first of all, you have to address the idea of multivocality, which is every tribe kind of has its own um, <laughs> story. And it's hard, like for example, you hear about one tribe coming from this area or that area. And then you'll hear about another tribe that says, no, we were there when you appeared there. So right. I, first of all, want to say that every tribe has a right to its own story and its own version of things. And sometimes even within tribes, there are going to be multiple versions of things, just like, uh, the, you know, back in the Southwest, the Kivas often don't communicate their own kind of ways. The clans were the same way. The clans originally, um, they had their own stories. They had their own origin stories and they, generally didn't share it with the other clans originally. So uh, the thing that I see is that uh, you have to go back in time. So the Iowa, Oklahoma, Missouri people and the Ho-Chunk or some call them Winnebago people kind of come from the same roots. Uh, all our traditions tend to indicate that we did a kind of a final separation from each other around the year 1500. And around the 15, year 1500, there were a lot of pressures coming from tribes from the east, especially the Algonquian tribes kind of moving up around the Great Lakes. There was also epidemics kind of going through the area, area and all that sort of stuff. So the Iowa, the Oto, Missouri, and Ho-Chunk languages are very, very similar. Um, sort of like the difference between, uh, say, Texans and New Yorkers. So it's very understandable, but there might be some, some terms that are different some pronunciations that are different, very similar. And we all share that, that um, point of view that we we're all one people at one time. Um, and then it's gradually separated for different reasons. There are different traditions about why we separated. And that would have been up around the upper Mississippi that that happened. Uh, you go back a little further than that. Um, and you're talking about uh, when the Mississippian people, the upper Mississippian people. So you have the upper Mississippian people that seem to have emerged out of the woodland people of the 
Upper Mississippi, that's what they call Upper Mississippian, the Middle, Missis or, uh, Middle Mississippi people, which would be more the Degiha people, including the Osage, uh, the Quapa, the Ponca, um, the um, Kanza, and uh, I'm forgetting somebody, Greg, who's the other one? There's five of them. Um, but anyway. Cause? Or you already said that. No, I, I did. But anyway. Yeah, you, you did, yeah. So, so the best indication, and you're dealing with oral traditions, and you're dealing with um, history and history as, as written isn't going to go back further than uh, some of the explorers that brought the written part of that into it. And by 1685, the French were already seeing us up, up there on the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. um, I think there might be some memories going on there of the time when um, we were all part of this kind of Mississippian culture that was up and down the Mississippi River. Um, the northern people, which would have been us, Winnebago, Ota, Missouri, uh, and then further north of us, some of the bands of Sioux, Midwest Canton, maybe, and some others up as far as St. Croix. Um, that would have been in the upper Mississippi, the middle Mississippi. That was a kind of a multi ethnic community, Cahokia. And the Osage and some of the others seemed to be more at, in Cahokia at that time period, um, especially the. Uh, 1400s, I think is about when that was fluorescent. And then uh, they kind of split up and they kind of moved over into kind of Northern Missouri and, uh, and into Kansas a little bit. So as far as the idea that we split up from the, the Yuha people, I don't see that our tradition support that. What I see instead is that we do have a common ground, not only in the Mississippian culture that was going on, in the Mississippi Valley, but there was very distinguished. It was very different, but there was probably trade going on and visiting at times probably. Um, but as far as coming down from the Ohio River Valley, that is going way, way back, probably right. into the late archaic, yeah. uh, maybe early woodland period. And that's about the same time that all the Siouan tribes from the Crow to the Dakota to all those. And again, we're talking about what <laughs> what archaeology shows, not what our individual oral traditions might show. But there was a commonality of language probably coming out from the Virginia Piedmont and into the Ohio River Valley. That seems to have been uh, kind of a uh, incubator for some of the Siouan languages. I mean, some of the terms that are similar come from that uh -huh. kind of area. And after that, uh, we all kind of went our own ways um, as best we can tell. So yeah, I would I think, say that's 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 how I see it. Yeah, and I think Burns was talking maybe yeah before the Mississippian period, uh, but it, yeah, it's I, interesting. I yeah, yeah, I think the Hopewell period, for example, we're talking about the Woodland period for the Hopewell uh -huh. people, some of the yeah. mound builders and stuff. I'm sure that we, uh, I know that there are, there's uh, Norse farms. I think 36 showed that there was Iowa DNA in some of the um, individuals there. And that was in Wisconsin, but it was connected very much with the uh, Hopewell people, which kind of were connected with um, Ohio. So Lance, I'm gonna jump in and ask a question about, um, you know, it's been more popular now to, oh, shoot. Okay, so it's been more popular now to do um, the DNA testing through Ancestry and things like that. Uh, has the Iowa tribe been doing much of the DNA testing to kind of look at origins and connections or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a very tricky question too, because people feel very differently about doing that. Some are very much, you don't do that. You don't, you don't mess with the dead. You don't um, do these things. Some of these studies were done before tribes had much of a say in it. Um, it's kind of in kind of a holding pattern for most people now. So this, these, these uh, reports were done back in the say the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and so that sort of thing doesn't happen much anymore. As far as DNA, um, we know the ANZIC site up in Montana shows that there's a lot of connections with with um, even Asia, with uh, other places. And of course, some, some tribal people are gonna, you know, not hold to that, not, not, not agree with that. Um, one thing that's important to know about DNA, and I know it kind of comes from people's interest in right, trying to see if they have Indian ancestry in their, in their past. 
a lot of people family traditions have that um sometimes the dna can show whether you have you know native american blood way back there somewhere but there's a difference between having that blood and being a member of a tribe because one thing is biological but being a member of a tribe is not only cultural but political and that is why um even though we may have um links if you're not a member of a tribe and recognized as a member of a tribe um then then you're really you can't come up with DNA and say, I'm going to be a member of a tribe. That's not how it works. Tribes have their own membership criteria and they enroll people separately, differently. It usually comes from having a descendant of some kind, uh, whether it's a mother, father, whatever, who enrolls you um, for the tribe. But every tribe has its own standards and on what that what the requirement is. Um, one of the things that I found very interesting from the conversation in Highland, Kansas, um, what, what's your total tribal membership right now? Well, total is, it's north of 4,000. And at the lowest point in the Iowa history, uh, how low was the tribal membership? Uh, it varied between 150 to 300. Yeah, I was going to say when, when uh, the, the tribe split to go down, part of them went to Oklahoma. I think there were less than 100 in Oklahoma and less than 100 in Kansas. Right. <laughs> excuse me so it was very low yeah and I, and I think that's an amazing story to think about um you know having a tribe um tribal membership that was so low at one point and and now to have been able to to grow that back is a, an amazing story of resiliency um so we should probably talk about the split between the Oklahoma tribe and and the um Iowa and Kansas did you want to maybe share with um with our listeners kind of how what happened there why why is it split why are there two iowa tribes in different on di different reservations um i guess uh, okay so right before that happened in the 1870s and they the iowa of oklahoma got their uh, reservation confirmed by executive order i think it was in 1883 right in the 1870s when people were moving south um, right before that was the Civil War, right? And during wars, men come home and they're going through a lot of stuff. They're trying to figure things out. They're trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. They've seen things that people at home can't, can't believe that they've seen. Um, we know that some of the men that came home after the Civil War, and it's important to notice that the, uh, to note that the Iowa people, the Iowa men, the greatest proportion of them served in the Civil War in the Union cavalry and um right. infantry right right greg i think greg knows more about the particulars than he's done a yeah there most of them were in the in that 14th cavalry but there were probably about 17 or or so that were in the in the infantry that were the first to sign up and they served in oklahoma too i mean they they were almost all of them were active in that you know around fort smith and so in that oklahoma kansas arkansas um, so they knew that country when they got back home. So that's probably where you hear the story about when they went back and they said, you know, there's still game down there, guys. Mm -hmm. There's places you can still hunt. We can still live, live like Indians down there. You know, part of what was going on up here was there was continuing pressure from non-Indian settlers to get more and more of the land. I mean, we had lost yeah. the land several times. It was unremitting pressure to get those Indians out there and give us that land, that farmland. The Indians just waste that farmland. Yeah. But we were farming too, but they just wanted the land. So there was this pressure between what they had seen in the service in the Civil War and um, that the tribes they knew, Sac and Fox and others in Oklahoma were still able to live in villages, much yeah. the same <laughs> old way, you know, kind of doing the things that they were used to. And all this pressure up here and all the disaster and epidemics and stuff that had happened up here, I think there was a good proportion that just wanted to go go where they could be Indian, you know, and, and not always having to face all this stuff up here all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like the split to, and it wasn't, it tended to be the more full-blooded ones went south to live in that kind of communal way, but there were mixed bloods that went there and there were full bloods that stayed up here too. So the division seemed to be more with the way you wanted to live your life. Down, the ones that went there wanted to live in the old traditional way as best they could. And the ones up here said, well, we have to accommodate the situation and we're going to keep what we can. 
but they were attached to the places they had developed as homesteads, as homes, as cabins, especially the women. The women put together a petition to say, we don't want to go. You know, the chiefs, except for a few, had voted to go down south. But then I think it was Tom Lightfoot um, put, well, talked with women and they got a petition together and they said, no, we don't want to go. We developed all these, all these places and we don't want to go that we, we want to do this. So uh, Greg may have a few things to add too on that. Well, and what's interesting about that too, is that that split was pretty much 50, 50, right Lance? That the, about half the tribe went down there, went down to Oklahoma. They, uh, like, like you said, the Sac and Fox, who they had a long-term relationship with, not only the ones they shared the agency with or the reservation with, but uh, the Sac and Fox, when they went down there, the Iowa's actually shared the Sac and Fox reservation in Oklahoma for a while. Um, and, you know, it was interesting how first a small group went down to Oklahoma and then they must have liked it because it seemed like it was a trickle of Iowa's moving down there for a period of maybe five years or so, maybe less than that. But and and so, yeah, to stay in Kansas, those Iowa's would have been more committed to sort of Euro American style agriculture, you know, and. And then, the, the, like you said, Lance, the, the people who moved down to Oklahoma. There, there was also a, a part of it, too, which is uh, 1837, when um, Nohart did his map uh, uh -huh. trying to refute the Indian land claims. He said, you know, the proof of our having been here are all these graves or all these places where we lived, our sites and stuff. And those graves of the forefathers are what make that place ours. And so right. continuing that same kind of thinking, we're very much attached to our to our ancestors and so another part uh, people didn't want to move from here there's a lot of burials up here there are a lot of play right. graveyards and stuff and they didn't want to abandon their graveyards to strangers and they and that, you know iways had been removed how many times they'd had to move out of missouri into what was then the plat purchase and then they were told they could stay there then they had to move across the river to the reservation they have now and uh, that was all within, you know, one generation, two generations memory. So people remembered that. They remembered how they'd been uprooted two or three times. And, and uh, I've run across different letters and testimonies where I always just said, no, you know, we're not moving anymore. And, and their tenacity in keeping that land, I think, is part of the reason that reservation still exists today when so many others like the you know, uh, so many other uh, nations were moved to Oklahoma and the reservations were disbanded. So let's step back a little bit um, and look at this picture. This is uh, by George Catlin and, and it's probably from the 1830s, I would say. Um, as a yeah. museum professional, I'm very interested in the material culture and some of the mm -hmm. most interesting conversations I, I feel that I've had with Lance's looking at the change of dress over time um you know sometimes we we get this notion that you know native american people you know they were always this this one particular way they always wore these particular clothes but looking at the change of the culture over time is is really interesting and so some of those earlier paintings that we've seen um lance you've studied those and, and been able to identify individuals who were painted um as well as kind of the, the change in dress over time. So do, do you, either of you wanna talk about the people in this painting and, and how the paintings came about and what we know from this particular painting? Is this I, from, I, go yeah. ahead, Lance. No, go ahead, I'll finish it up. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask, is this from um, before they went to London? This before the like, Iowa? This is when uh, Catlin saw him down by Fort Leavenworth. Okay, before that time, because Catlin, uh, yeah, he traveled up the Missouri River and was making sort of a, a catalog of paintings of, he was painting as many different uh, uh, Native people as he could. Um, he'd been a lawyer, you know, who lived in Pennsylvania, I think is where he grew up and, and wanted to go out to the Wild West and become an artist. And, and he did, and he had a, a really good eye for detail and he was, uh, he was very prolific. I mean, he did, he did hundreds and hundreds uh, of portraits. 
And um, so he went past the first time he met Iowa's is probably, I think, in 30, 1833, 34, something like that, uh, when he first made his trip up the Missouri River. And so maybe Lance, this was this was painted then. And then um, he, oh, about a decade later, then he had 14 Iowa's come to London where he was doing a show. Uh, so he, be, between the paintings he did before and the paintings he did in the 1840s, we actually have kind of a nice catalog of portraits done by George Catlin of, uh, of Iowa's. This looks to me like probably it was done, maybe it's in a colored etching or something maybe that was done for one of his books, his publication. It has a little less detail than some of his paintings, but uh, yeah, he knew he knew a lot of the people, and uh, and like I said, he had a really good eye for detail. Lance, why don't why don't you tell us what you know? Um, so when I pulled this painting up, I I had no idea how to identify the individuals in the painting. So that was one of the questions I, uh -huh. I asked of Lance: is um, you know, can you identify these particular in, individuals? And and Lance, you were able uh -huh. to uh, give us some thoughts on that. Well. These guys are basically pictures in, in, in this book. Mm -hmm. um, originally, they were done as separate individuals, um, etchings or lithography, whatever they mm -hmm. were. He, he did as sketches mainly to begin with. Yeah. And then later, he grouped these two, three together. There's actually another person that he had drawn at well, as well at the same time. Um, so as far as me being a magic guy, they can like come up with you know well, who these guys were. I have a source. <laughs> So, um, so the guy on the left, um, Father Cucci, um, so he was, um, you see, as a club there, the Gunstock War Club, and they all have, um, they, they, Iowa what style was not generally to be a long hair person with the braids that came in later, maybe with the kind of a pan Indian kind of a style. Originally, we were more like um, the Omahas and the Pawnees and all those guys in this area, which were connected with the Eastern Woodlands, kind of an Iroquois and kind of a kind of a hairstyle with uh, basically very short cropped hair with the the braid, the braid, the braid scalp lock coming down, which is where the seat of the soul was. Uh, a lot of times they did wear bands around their heads. Sometimes it was fur, sometimes it was cloth. Most of these look cloth, except the guy on the right looks like German silver. Um, and some of those were for um, not only when you're working hard to keep the sweat out of your eyes, but they seem to be also be kind of a, a defense against club strikes, um, kind of like a, a helmet almost. Um, <laughs> the, red, the red deer tail, Tatinia, um, also, you know, porcupine hair, guard hairs and stuff were used on them, depending on, you know, who made them. Um, but they were red, they kind of uh, uh, symbolized the um, connection with the sun and the woodpecker who was a um, kind of a bird of the sun, a solar bird. And it showed when you were up like that as a warrior, we, we wore those rather than the headdresses of the Northern Plains because that showed that you were angry and you were ready to go to war. Just like a woodpecker when he's angry is, gets his roach kind of a, up and uh, ready to go. Um, the guy on the far right of course has a, has a pipe um, and the Iowa were guardians of the pipestone quarry uh, from before 1700 and before we were kind of um, edged out by some of the tribes um, domino effect kind of going across the northern plains there. The guy uh, on the on the right, um, I think that was pays no attention. Uh, no, his name was a uh, good sense, man of good sense. Why you and why you mean mine. Yeah, there's a lot of words in our language that um, either pass from use or hard to decipher from some of the spelling <laughs> inherited from, from before. People kind of spelled randomly because we didn't have a system of spelling. Yeah. And people still yeah. argue about spelling anymore anyway. So right. spelling's difficult. The guy in the middle is kind of a riddle because on the one hand, um, Callan identified him as uh, White Cloud, the son of the, a man of the same name, present chief of the Iowa tribe, also known as No Heart. And that's hard mm -hmm. to, to figure out because no heart actually was his uncle uh, no heart right. was white cloud the first brother and uncle to uh, white cloud the second this looks like a younger man 
So I'm kind of thinking because Catlin kind of focused on it being the chief, I think maybe he misheard. So I'm kind of thinking this was more than likely White Cloud. Plus in the 1840s, when Catlin uh, hosted them or kind of traveled with them over in Europe, right. he knew White Cloud pretty well. So I'm thinking this is <clears throat> White Cloud the second rather than No Hard. And you can see he the did. buffalo robes that they had that by the time uh, the I think our last buffalo hunt was like 1857 or so um, because it was just too far away anymore. So I think these would be some of the last, say, traditional wear pre-reservation clothing. Um, and we'll see an example later after, you know, all the hides, all the game is kind of killed off. All, you know, all the people coming in, smashing to small and smaller places, all the games kind of disappearing. And so this is kind of the last gasp of the pre-contact kind of clothing that we would have had. Thank you. I'm going to go on down. Um, so um, here in St. Joseph, um, Joseph Rubidoux is known as the founder. Um, he comes to the area um, in the early 1800s, and, and he's primarily an Indian trader. He trades with the Indians for furs. Um, so Lance or Greg, um, either of you, did you want to kind of go into the connection between Joseph Rubidoux and the founding of St. Joseph and the Iowa tribe? And what did that look like? How, how, can, how does that history look? I can probably take a, take a swing at that. Um, the thing about trade is that especially French traders figured out pretty early on that it was good for business if you, uh, you know, over the winter, they would live oftentimes with some of the nations with whom they were trading. And they'd actually, you know, they, they would actually live in the, in the villages, live alongside. And of course, often they would marry uh, native women um, in part because it was good for business. Uh, if you, Joseph Rubidoux, for instance, uh, married uh, White Cloud's daughter, or it, it was called a country marriage. They used to call them country marriages. Rubidoux had a family in St. Louis, but he would, while he was out in the field, he would establish relationships with native women. Um, because if you could have a country marriage with a daughter of an important person, then that was really good, a good connection to have in the tribe. Um, it gave you as a trader an inroad into the tribe for business, but it also enhanced the family, you know, the Iowa family within the tribe, because if you were related to a French trader, then you had a direct conduit to business. And this is part of, I think Lance touched on it earlier, you know, kinship where, um, I think in native culture, there was a lot of kinship relationships were formed. And it was like, you know, you'll become my relative, my hunka is what the Lakotas call it. And, uh, you know, I'll have your back and you have my back. We're family, even though we came from different parts. So pretty quickly then, uh, Rubidoux became uh, uh, related by blood to the Iowa's. And then, of course, uh, Rubidoux's, um, Rubidoux's daughter was the married, ended up marrying uh, the second White Cloud. I made a mistake earlier, and I said that he had a relationship with one of White Cloud's daughters. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to, yeah, at, at the risk of getting this all mixed up, uh, we don't know the, the woman with whom Rubidoux had a relationship with. But Rubidoux's half French, half Iowa daughter did marry uh, the second white cloud. So that, you know, he had a really close relationship uh, with that family. One of the things I found, I've been going through a lot of the treaties now, and uh, you know, the, the Platt Purchase Treaty was interesting because, so Joseph Rubidoux was there as a witness when they signed this treaty. Frank White Cloud or White Cloud II was one of the signatories to that treaty. So I kind of wonder by that time they were already related by blood. And I kind of wonder as they sat as adversaries kind of on, on uh, separate sides of, the, of the, the treaty table, what were the dynamics there? It would have been really fascinating because of course, uh, White Cloud was not terribly obviously excited about signing away the Platt purchase. And Rubidoux 
stood to gain financially a lot if he could get the plat purchase to go through because of course the, the future site of St. Louis or St. Joseph and his trading post was in that. So it, it's an interesting kind of, I don't know if I want to use the word incestuous, but, but, you know, blood kinship was good for business, but it also kind of made for some really complicated relationships. Lance, you want to take it from there? No, yeah, it's good. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, I mean, so St. Joseph really, when he formed that town, and I think a, a lot of the reason, you know, the plat purchase was not originally part of the state of Missouri. The old Missouri state line went straight north from Kansas City up to Iowa. And that was originally supposed to be what they called an Indian territory. And uh, a lot of people in the state of Missouri were looking to places like Rubidoux's, uh, Rubidoux's uh, trading post on the Missouri River and they thought, you know, it would be economically a really good deal if Missouri could get that land and annex it into the state, which they did in 1836. And, and of course the Iowa's uh, along with the Sac and Fox and some other nations were, were uh, uh, signatories to that. And so that was the second time the Iowa's had were removed because of a treaty. Yeah, and the whole situation, I, I think <clears throat> Joseph Ruby was an incredibly complicated human being, as, as most uh, of us are. Um, you know, <clears throat> he, he had uh, these extramarital relationships or a second marriage um, with Iowa ladies. Um, there's a lot of complications, I think, with the dynamics of the Iowa, the women of the Iowa tribe and um, marrying into the European settlers, um, you know, for economics and you know how much agency they had in those decisions or, or whether those were um, things that they were kind of made to do. And Lance, maybe at some point we could talk more about that. I don't know, because we'll talk about Kurz. Um, and then certainly Joseph Ribadu is important in this conversation because he also was a slave owner. Um, right. Jeffrey DeRoyne came to the area with him and, and he'll, he'll turn up later too as Joseph Ribadu's slave. So we'll move on to this next slide um, and let you guys talk about the, the interesting trip to Europe and maybe Jeffrey DeRoyne and Catlin's relationship with the Iowa tribe and, and all of these things. So for a long time, I thought that uh, the man on the far right was Catlin, but actually that's not. That's um, Mary. Uh, Melody, right? Mr. Melody, the guy who, who was one of their uh, chaperones, I guess, through Europe. And then the, first, the second one over is, uh, is Darren A. Jeffrey. And as far as I know, that is the only, only photograph or photograph, only image we have of, of him. People, and Lance, people you probably know the others. I was just gonna say people here generally, I mean, there was a lot of different ways they spelled his name, Dora Way, all these others. Right. I think people here generally say DeRoyne in general. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but you know, there's a lot of ways to talk about. Now, these are not <clears throat> all the ones went, there was supposedly a party of 14. Uh, you don't see Corsair, who was the baby born on the steamship before they went over there. Uh, but you see a lot of people, the guy on the far left, for example, we generally, like I said, don't, didn't have headdresses. This guy stands uh, out. This is blistered feet, Sinodea, which means sort of like he uh, went a long ways. And so far his feet got, feet got blistered, like on the warp path. So medicine people did go to war back then. And uh, so that's Sinodea, um, the doctor. And um, you have uh, Nohomunyan, pays no attention. You got White Cloud back there. You got a lot of the people uh, and what the, what the way Bukana, or the young boy there, and Sophie, uh, Sophia, um, or Sophia, some say, um, Tapatami, the wisdom, the little girl there. Um, so these are all different people who traveled in 18, well, they got, they were there from 1844 to 1845. It started earlier, of course. And their entire journey has been interest to me since the 1980s when I found out about it. Uh, in fact, at one time, I wanted to kind of retrace their footsteps in Europe and kind of compare what they saw and what's there now. Um, that was always a dream of mine as a young man. Um, one of our tribal members, Sarita McGowan, has traveled over there because Corsair, the little baby, three of these people died over there, uh, apparently of consumption. 
and, or tuberculosis. And the water, the air is very dirty over there. There's a lot of disease and everything. So three of these people never came home. Um, there was uh, one woman who died from um, um, Okiwimi. Um, she died. Uh, the first one was Roman Nose. Um, and he was a uh, white cloud. You no, know, it was Little Wolf's buddy, um, kind of a war friend. He is buried somewhere in Scotland. I think it was in North Shields. Um, then, um, then Corsair uh, was buried in, uh, I think it was in France, mm -hmm. oh, in London. And then, uh, God, do you remember, Greg? Anyway, he's, I think he's in buried in England because I found where his uh, burial ground, burial was, and we've been trying to think about repatriating this baby to come back mm -hmm. home. We, we did uh -huh. repatriate one student who died in, um, in the, uh, Carlisle back Carlisle. East cup last year, I think it was, and we brought him home. Henry Jones was his name. And um, we've been trying to find ways to bring our people home because they always wanted to be buried in their own land. And then, of course, Okiwi Me uh, was little Wolf's wife. So his best friend, his baby, his wife all died on that trip. Little Wolf. And in the Indian way of thinking, they'd be like, why him? What happened with him? Why was he the one that was targeted like that? Because before the thing that made them decide to come back home was they had a dream about one of the spiritual people that came up from under a basket and a bridge. And this per person, this lady said, you know, some things are coming after you. Something's coming after you. And that was part of that whole drama of uh, Little Wolf turning in certain people that had tried to kill Bill, Big Elk, the Omaha. And all these things were going on. These, and there's always unseen portions to all these dramas that were going on. And they reverberate through family lines even to today. So um, these people went over there to try to make some money performing to bring back mm -hmm. money home because things were so hard here. We went over there and they ended up giving away most of their money to poor people there. And when they come home, big trunk full of Bibles. The people Bible. kept trying to convince them that the Indian way was wrong and the Christian way. Was wrong. And they were like, they already had missions here. They already had like the Presbyterians telling them all that. And right. they're like, no, you've never heard about the word. It's like, yeah, we did. Please, please just leave me alone. You know, so it was a complicated deal, but um, but that's a little bit about 1844 to 1845. These guys. I would, know you. And I would just add too that um, anybody who's interested in, I, I think that Catlin narrative about that trip is pretty fascinating because because Catlin traveled with these with the Iowas for so long and he knew them pretty well and so he was able to give uh, readers a sense of what the Iowa saw and how they viewed the French and the English you know, when they were in Europe. Usually when you like, there's an Osage book about Osages visiting uh, Europe and there you just get what did the Europeans see. But I think Catlin's book is really valuable because he's able to convey some sense of how the Iowa saw the Europeans and, and it wasn't terribly favorable. It's a yeah, good read. It is. And, I, and I've got that over there on the left. If anybody wants that as a reference, Catlin's notes of eight years travels and residence in Europe. And um, it is a really excellent book and um, gives a good history of that trip. So well, let's move on down to the next slide. Um, this is uh, Rudolf Frederick Kurz, and, and he's coming through the St. Joseph area, um, 1847, 40. Um, well, no, it says here 80, 1846 to 1852, but I think he's actually in St. Joseph 1847 and 48 and, and 49 too, because I know he's here during those gold rush years. Um, and the St. Joseph Museums, we actually just recently did an exhibit at East Hills Mall um, where we, we revisited uh, some sketches of Rudolf Kurz um, in the St. Joseph area. And I had asked Greg and Lance to come over and, and consult on that. And I don't know, guys, either of you can share what your thoughts are, what we learned from Kurz's trip and his sketches um, about the Iowa tribe. I, I guess I would say Lance is probably going to mention this too, but it's interesting to compare these uh, Kerr's drawings and paintings with the uh, Catlins. I think, uh, and we talked about this last year when we were looking at the at the exhibit about how how Kerr seems to be more idealistic 
probably because he was a much better trained artist than Catlin was. Catlin was just sort of an amateur who picked up a paintbrush and through hard work, you know, uh, was able to become really good, but he also didn't carry a lot of that academic baggage along. And it, to me, to my eye anyway, uh, just even looking at this picture right, <laughs> right here, Kerr seems to, I mean, this al almost looks as much like a Roman god or a Greek god as it does a Native American. I don't know, Lance, what your thoughts about it are. Yeah. There's that same kind of neoclassical time period yeah, that when we're yeah. trying to idealize Greco-Roman culture and everything. <clears throat> um, one thing that's important to note here too is notice that their clothing is switched to cloth mm -hmm. and you know that loss of game. Just in those 10, 15 years from the 1830s until now, we're talking about the early 19, 1850s, you know, people had, didn't have the access to hides and stuff that they did at, at one time. Um, this is supposed to be white cloud. Um, and notice his hairstyles turned into a pompadour type hairstyle. And you've looked at some of the old daguerreotypes of Nohart as an older man yeah. and hair, his hairstyle <laughs> turned into a pompadour kind of thing too. Um, so it's important to remember it's a combination of this hairstyle, these clothing, the material culture you see. Indians were not frozen into one time period. Just like everybody else, there were styles that came in. They were like, oh, let's use I'm into the red leggings now. I think I'm going to do that now. So there was things that came in, German silver, other kinds of things. You can see uh, eagle bone whistle around his neck. You can see um, uh, a, a quirt around his wrist. Some quirts are some of the more common, uh, well, the most noticeable um, Iowa material culture that still survives, made out of antler or bone sometimes. What's interesting to me in this one is that pot at his foot because most people say that I always stopped making pots uh, around the 1700 or so, but you can see clearly that that has one there. And in fact, if you look very closely, there's a design that looks very much like some of the Oneota kind of styles mm -hmm. that you will see on pots as well. There's a larger pot with a different kind of rim and the smaller pot, a lot of the smaller pots have to do with burials and offering kind of pot. pot. Um, it's not made by kids, it's for specific offering kinds of purposes. Um, so that's a very interesting one. Um, and you will see later on it, by the 1870s and 1880s, that's when we start having all the, the very dark wool clothing, sprouting and things with the curvilinear beadwork that starts um, once all the tribes start interacting in Kansas. Um, so the styles were always changing. So to put this into some context, um, so this is White Cloud and he, this would have been after he came back from his trip to Europe. So right. this gentleman in this painting has also traveled and met the King of France and the courts of Europe. And, and he's back now in the St. Joseph area, um, which I think is really amazing um, just to kind of contextualize that time period of, of how it's going. And so also this time period, Kurz writes about Western migration and, and the kickoff of the California gold rush and all of the settlers that are, are passing through. Um, also, Lance, isn't one of the ladies in this supposed to be Watahe, um, who was the, the, the lady that married uh, Kurz? Yeah, um, and that, that's an interesting name because there's another name that's very similar called Witatai, which means here's pounding. And it's a particular lead family that had that right to that name. And it kind of reflects how um, they heard uh, people making, uh, an old man making a pipe up at Pipestone a long time ago. So that name kind of goes, names go through clans and through families. And that's how it's passed down even today. And that, that, that young woman was the one that I guess um, Kurtz became enamored with. Her father, I think was Neomani, um, were the one because her father talked about his having gone over with uh, to Europe and, and talked about his interaction there. And, um, and Kuruche was what they call him, Kuruche uh, is what they call him there. But people did have several names. Um, anyway, it, it may be that. And her father was also noted as being one who was very business savvy. And even the missionaries and everybody noticed that uh, Neomani was the one who was the one trying to always figure out how the money works for the white man and, and pretty savvy on that kind of thing. So he thought saw it as a strategic alliance. Well, the young girl was like, she was, wasn't having it. So she ran off 
And um, that was kind of the, the end of that romance, really. Didn't yeah. you want to get in, into business with Curse, Curse too? Like, I'm, I yep. can't remember just what it was, but right. they, he wanted him to be his business partner. Right. Her father, yeah. Yeah, Curse was terribly brokenhearted. He, he was um, much enamored with, with Tahe, it seemed. Um, but that's a very good source, the, the Journal of Rudolf Frederick Kurz, if you want to hear and learn about that early history of St. Joseph. Especially when they were in the St. Joseph area. Yeah. Yeah. Because they would travel across the ice to get um, leavings off of the, the plants where they butchered hogs and yeah. things like that. So um, here, I, there's a, a couple of significant portrait collections um, that give us an insight into the um, the Iowa Indians in the 1800s. Um, one is George Catlin's work. The other are what are referred to as the McKinney Hall portraits. And um, both of these portraits are of Mahaska White Cloud. Um, and I thought it was interesting to kind of just put one person in the same kind of slide to see the comparison of, of what we can learn from the material culture and, and that. They, the these are two, two different, yeah, it's father oh. and son. They're okay. two different white clouds. The one on the right is the elder, and that's okay. uh, that's a um, etching or a yeah lithograph that was made from a um, Charles Bird King, I think. Charles Bird King painting, yeah. And then this is a the, the one on the left is a Catlin painting of the younger White Cloud. And I have the actual McKinney Hall on the next slide of him, so these okay. actually aren't the same ones, um, which is confusing with White Cloud always. <laughs> it is. So how can you tell the difference between the younger and the older? Um, you know, what's tipping you off there? Well, I just know the pieces. Um, the right. Bird Same King way with me. Is originally, the original, I think, is in Gilcrease down in Oklahoma, which I've seen. It is. Yeah. And along with Moana Hong of Great Walker and all those guys. Real yeah. nice. But then you have to simplify things when you do a lithograph. So he's got the bear claw kind of um, claw sign on his face. Um, uh, the one on the right and um so that's how we know we know because the labels <laughs> i didn't know the yeah. guy myself <laughs> yeah okay so um let's go to this next slide um so ranchy how do you pronounce this lance well it would be ruche is a pigeon why is the is the fly why why is a little bird me is a female suffix. So Ruchuayimi is how they actually say it. But, you know, people spoiled kind of think. And things kind of weird and hinky sometimes. So that's what it means. A, a pigeon that flies that's female. Okay. And this is also an etching. Th this is done also from a Charles Bird King painting because she accompanied the elder white cloud when they uh, went to Washington in 1824 to sign the... Um, uh, the treaty to of 1824 to cede the northern half of Missouri. And she um, fell off, well, they when on the way back, mm -hmm. she fell off her horse and um, the younger one, the, the older one, the father came back to find her. She had been killed when she fell off her horse and the younger white cloud was there asking, you know, crying for his mother, you know, what, what happened mm -hmm. to my mother? So that happened. Um, anyway, that's that's the story that goes with it. So, so let's look at a little bit closely at her dress. So what's, what's going on here? So is this a calico pattern? Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, there was a lot of trade goods going on even back then. Um, so, you know, people of high style, uh, people who are of a higher family or an important family, they're going to want the latest and the best, you know. So, you know, you can bet more than likely the the regular woman who was maybe of a family not advantage would still be wearing the old hide dresses back then. And it would be like, oh, I'm getting the high tone stuff, the Yves Saint Laurent stuff from uh, <laughs> France, you know, and I'm looking good. So, you know, it's just, it's the same kind of thing. I think that um, the people wanted to dress as, as best they could with the latest fashion. And that's what this was. And, and, and remember too that, that this painting that. was done in uh, Washington D.C. It was not done on the reservation. And yeah. so when um, when delegations of of natives were brought to Washington D.C., it was not uncommon for them to go clothes shopping at the government expense, and they were given 
um, clothes to wear because a lot of times part of what they were doing was going out to public appearances and things and they could dress, you know, in fancy uh, European style clothing or in, in their own clothing. So I, I suspect maybe this is something also that maybe was bought for them while they were in DC, bought for her. Yeah, and and the, and you said she, she had traveled to. Was she on the trip to Europe? I don't think so. No. Yeah, because okay. she's the wife. Well, of no, her. yeah, because she died. She on the way. Right. What Lance said, she died on the way home. Okay. Or soon after. Okay. Um, so, so let's tie this back, I guess, to Joseph Rubidoux um, and this relationship with the Indian tribe. Um, and this is a woman I was meant to, on the the woman on the left is the woman I was talking about earlier who was Joseph Rubidoux's daughter uh, with an Iowa woman okay. and married uh, Francis White Cloud. Um, and Lance, do you want to say anything about um, his armbands or the material culture that you see <clears throat> in this picture? No, except for, you know, Indian people didn't see, I mean, we would say those are somewhat feminine uh, bracelets, but um, the thing is that probably uh, people were gifted things. And we talked, heard about it in, um, when Callan went to Europe, that a lot of the ladies would take, you know, bracelets off their own arm and put them on people's arms or rings or whatever. So these are probably just ones that ad his admirers had given him at various times and places. This is when he was still a hopeful young man, even before he went over to over to uh, England, mm -hmm. because it, they noted in the English um, that English period that um, he kind of became somewhat gloomy after seeing what was going on over there. And when he came back before he was, this is him kind of progressive as an idealistic young man. And he mm -hmm. goes over in his thirties, he comes back and he actually starts uh, going to war and stuff. He didn't want to be like, um, he doesn't believe in it anymore. He says, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out like an Indian, you know, he's going to, he's going to, you know, he's, and that's when the missionaries started complaining about him and the agent ended up, you know, relieving him of his station, so to speak. Interesting. Um, we have a couple more. Oh, something has happened. I'm sorry for that. Um, hold on just one second. Let's see if I can get my screen fixed. Well, you can uh, go ahead and let's talk about pneumonia and um, this slide as I'm working on getting this fixed. Well, pneumonia was um, rain walking. Niu is, to, is it's raining. Mania is something moving across the landscape. Usually, you could be translated as walking, but it could be as moving as well in a continuous manner. Um, so. He's, uh, that's one of the traditional names of the Eagle Thunder Clan. And um, he was a war chief for the Iowas, one of the war chiefs. And he went over to England with the rest of them. And it was his daughter, um, at least the best evidence right now is that that was his daughter that um, briefly was betrothed or married or whatever to Kurtz. Um, and he was a businessman and he, um, he was pretty savvy. The, um, the missionaries noted him as having a very good mind and being kind of uh, aware of what was going on. Now this guy on the right there identified Washkamani. Uh, he was also Jim, they called him, and he was over there. He was a kind mm -hmm. of a wag, a scallywag. Uh, <laughs> he was always joking around with the doctor. They both had like, people think Indian, Indian people, you know, um, if they don't know you, yeah, kind of stand off. It's kind of like, got to put on your face because you'll know what you're dealing with and you have dignity but among friends i mean just joking all the time always joking you know and so these guys were always joking catlin wrote down a lot of their you know interactions teasing mm -hmm. each other and goofing around <clears throat> and um there's a lot of these individuals that i've been working on for biographies of them so we understand some of these people will change names over time yeah. and you know to find out more about when they passed away and what their ultimate um, um, fate was. That's, that's so important uh, for us to recapture our history. But we know a little bit about him, but we're trying to find out more. Yeah. 
Um, and then, you know, here are, you know, another series of, of prints, and we don't have to get into each of these individuals, um, but I think that um, you kind of get a, a good glimpse of what the material culture looks like, who these individuals are, and, and what we can learn from them. I don't know, Lance or Greg, do you have anything that you want to talk about with these particular? Just, just the fellow on the far right, Wanakanga, um, also known as Great Walk or Big Neck. Um, he was actually, if we, if you want to talk about the Iowa's trying to find their way through what was happening, um, people always wonder, well, why didn't we fight like the Lakota did and everything? Well, we did, we did fight. War of 1812 was our last fight against mm -hmm. the Americans as a, as a people. The biggest group of people um, went with the British trying to keep the Americans out of our land. But, um, but we picked the wrong winning, not the winning side in that case. And so um, in 1815, we made a treaty. Everybody made peace. 1824, um, the story is um, that kind of we got conned out through interpretation and whatever misunderstandings. White Cloud was one person the United States recognized as White Cloud the Elder, I'm talking about, uh, yeah. as being, um, you know, pro American. So they wanted to recognize him as a head chief, but there's a significant faction under uh, Monahonga who didn't want to move from Missouri, did not. And when he found out he had sold the land, he painted his face black for the rest of his life and refused mm -hmm. to. He was, uh, I think it was 1829, there was an incident yeah. where he had a fight with some of the local militia guys who wanted to kind of provoke trouble and get those Indians out of there. There was a misunderstanding, long story. Look under the Big Neck Affair and you'll learn more about that. Um, but the upshot was he was actually acquitted of murder of white people. By white time, people, yeah. Right, in a time when that would have been unheard of. It would have been unheard of, but it was a matter of jurisdiction really and they had to acquit him. And he refused still to move over on the reservation. He and his band, there was a final battle, him and, and Little Star, who fought the Yankton Sioux, who were still fighting us. And the Yankton chief and Big Neck supposedly died in hand-to-hand -hand battle, and they killed each other. And from that time forward, that's when we made peace with the Sioux, which we had been fighting up to about 1700 to about, you know, 1840s is when that was going on. Oh, okay. Um, interesting. Uh, so let's talk about the the reservation and the treaties and 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 all of that. Who who wants to jump on that? This is Greg's map. Um, Go for it. Yeah, they're my maps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is okay. So after the Platte purchase, then this is what the reservation originally looked like when the Iowas and the Sac and Fox were moved, removed, I should say, into uh, Kansas. So. One thing I would say about that, you'll notice that the the um, boundary between the Iowas and the Sac and Fox is kind of weird shaped. And so the Sac and Fox get this long, narrow band of land that stretches clear across there. And the reason for that is, is that um, the Iowas and the Sac and Fox, that of course the state of Missouri wanted them out of the plat purchase as soon as possible. You know, they wanted white settlers. White settlers were actually already living there. So uh, in the early spring of 1837, the Iowas and the Sac and Fox, or some of them anyway, moved over to the new reservation be, uh, because they wanted to get some crops in uh, in the spring. And what happened is uh, uh, some of the Sac and Fox set up villages on the east side of the Wolf River, uh, one of which was kind of right, not too far from the town of Sparks in Kansas, uh, just sort of north and, and uh, east of the town of Sparks. And then some of the Iowas set their villages up on the, on the west side of the Wolf River. And uh, no one had ever really bothered to survey it out until that summer. And then when Isaac McCoy, the surveyor came, he had to somehow draw two equal uh, land masses out of that reservation without once again uprooting and moving villages. So you have the Iowas then on the west side and the Sac and Fox on the east side and then he drew it that kind of, <laughs> and then also I think it must have been Lance that the mission had already chosen its spot as well because the, you'll see the land dips down to, uh, to go right south of the mission. 
It ended up where the mission building itself was right up on the highway yeah. land, but the barn and the farm part was more on the second fox. Second fox. And that's why if you look at a, a map of that, of the road that goes east out of Highland right now and goes right next to the mission site, it's not on a, um, it's not on the square mile gr grid. It's like a half mile or it's an odd road that doesn't really fit to the sec to the survey. And that's why is because that road was there. That was the old boundary between the Iowa and the Sac and Fox um, reservations. But that's what it looked like. So that was what, I think they each got 200 square miles. And um, yeah, if you look at that far kind of left corner of the Sagan Fox land, that's not far away from the present town of Hiawatha. It was roughly supposedly 20 miles from the point on the river straight west is what the, following the Kickapoo line was where the original uh, idea yeah. was. Okay, well, let's, let's move on and, and look at how this changes over the history, so. Yeah, so 1854, of course, that's the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And um, it, you know, there was, as Lance mentioned earlier, there was just a huge pressure from white settlers for, you know, because, because several nations had been moved into Eastern Kansas when they were trying to remove everybody from Missouri. You had the, the Kickapoos and the Shawnees and the Delawares and the Iowas and the Sac and Fox. And, and then as soon as the uh, uh, Missouri was settled, then the, with the uh, Kansas Nebraska Act, there was that same pressure. So in 1854, there's a treaty. And I think that the reservation is cut into half again. And then in 1861, there's another treaty. And that's the year, uh, I think that Mr. Uh, did Kansas become a state in 59 or 60? Anyway, it was not long after Kansas had become a state. And then the reservation, the, the Second Fox Reservation is completely disbanded, becomes settler land. And then the Iowa's if you look in the, in the uh, other map, the Iowa's are forced to share what's left of their reservation with the Sacks and the Foxes. So you end up with a reservation that is about an eighth the size of its original size in just a matter of, what, 25 years. But they held on to it, you know. So Lance, when we talk about the allotment period, <clears throat> Um, can you go into what that is for our um, vi visitors? Well, you, it's just done the th always the theme of getting the land from the Indians. So, um, you know, you've seen get rid, you know, sell off all your Aboriginal land, pressure for that. Now, whittle down the forever home down into a little small as possible. That's still not good enough. People still want that land. So then the allotment idea was you divide it into... Um, certain amounts of acreage for individuals. So heads of household, if they're male, they got 160 acres. Uh, females, heads of household got 80 acres. If you're an orphan, you get 40 acres. So in our case, the reservation was so small, some people didn't even get land. So some people were left off the list, for example. Hmm. Um, and the idea there was to make sure the Indians become American. It's called assimilation to make sure that we understand the value of individual land holdings and to not live in common in a village anymore like they were still doing in Oklahoma, uh, at least for a while, then they got allotted too. Um, but you gotta make us into people that want money, want property, kind of the nuclear family idea, not the extended clan. And that was all that kind of focus on trying to divide that land up. And in many places, if there was excess land, then that would sell that land off to non-Indians. So there's checkerboarded all across these different places. In our case, that happened from 1887 to 1892, when people who even didn't want to do allotment were forced to. to. Some people ended up selling theirs and moving down to Oklahoma based upon the situation that was going on. But from 1892 until 1906, um, the original idea was for 25 years, you could own your land, trust land, um, divided out. Then you had to, if you were declared competent, you could even lose it earlier. Then it was put into fee simple land, which you'd be taxed for. And um, you could do liens against mortgages, all that stuff, do good old American stuff. And then at that point, there was no, be no reservation. The whole idea was to get rid of reservations, to make everybody just be like 
like regular white neighbors and farmers and stuff, and then uh, get rid of that Indian problem. So that was the ideal. And uh, from 1892 until 1930, over 90% of our land was lost in that way. Um, people lost their land. Some of the local um, shopkeepers and stuff found ways to, to get people owing the money and stuff. So they'd have to sell it for taxes and stuff. So we lost 90% of our reservation. That little kind of pale gray part, that's all that was left. That was divided and 90% of that was lost. So that's where we were at. Wow. Wow. That, okay. was, that was always the story too, was to get, uh, to put native people into debt, you know, because if they didn't have money, they had land. And, and it's interesting that, you know, that was going on up until 1930, because that, that was going on as long as there's been a, a United States of America. That was sort of the modus operandi. So uh, I have included a couple of examples of reservation style of clothing, um, which, which is the more beadwork and woodland <laughs> style. Lance, do you want to talk about that or Greg? Well, I would say, I mean, Greg will probably have some good things to add on this, but um, you notice I talked about that change from cloth when you had white cloth standing there with a pot. You didn't see a lot of beadwork on that. You saw some ribbon work starting on some of the women's clothing. But this type of curvilinear, they call it curvilinear, prairie abstract, curvilinear floral uh, styles, that seems to have really begun as the interaction of people like the Delaware and Shawnee and Iowa and Oto, Missouri, all these people in what was called Indian country, Indian territory was further south, Indian country. And uh, yeah. this was a way to encode tribal knowledge and pass that on. Um, these were individuals or families designs that had things plants, um, other items that were important to them and to their spiritual ways. That was a way to like hide your knowledge, but also pass it on to your future generations. Some of these things we know what the symbols are, some of them are still private to different families. Um, that kind of uh, colorful on black with outlined by the white um, outlines and beads um, and the kind of the, the, the dualistic uh, approach, the mirror form. Uh, that um, talks about the above world, the, you know, the dual forms of life, you know, the, the day and the night, the above and below, all those things. And you'll see a man with holding pipes with, with the, the buffalo skull, and you'll see your uh, deer head below. On the other one, you'll see the horses and the American flags, and we're good Americans too, you know, which we didn't even get citizenship as a group until 1924. Um, <laughs> so the, all these things are encoded languages it's a visual language that we're trying to express here and um and it spread as a style it is still kind of our uh style that we're known for a lot of tribes in, from omaha down south into oklahoma same way little bit little differences here and there but their family owned kind of um styles greg you might want to have some things well actually i have a question for you lance would these have come from uh from uh, pan-indian um you know, relations where they're trading ideas. Would these have come from Kansas or would they, or well, would this, this have started in Oklahoma, do you think? This would have been it's the 1850s and 1860s. Okay, so it's before started. really Oklahoma. So it was, yeah, it was even before Oklahoma. Okay. Ever we sent down south. No, I just love this stuff, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't really have anything to add except <laughs> I, I really like it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Uh, and same for, for oh, the moccasins. Well, one thing I mentioned about the uh, the bear claw necklace there, which yeah. is, uh, you can still see it in our casino. It was repatriated uh -huh. um, as an effort by our tribe. Uh, it was um, the claw necklace of White Cloud family that was repatriated to our tribe. Um, prairie, grizzly claws, very long claws, as long as your finger, or even longer, depending on your finger. And... Um, you can see on the sides of them, even little tiny patterns, dots. They're very similar to the dots on quartz and things like that. Um, that's, that's otter fur wrap. That would have been revived or replenished as the fur wore out. But that's a very old a necklace because prairie grizzly, you know, basically disappeared uh, with the coming of uh, non-Indians. I mean, um, you can f still find grizzlies way up in the mountains of Montana and stuff. But even Lewis and Clark didn't see grizzlies till they reached the Great Falls of Montana. So... That's a really old necklace. 
Yes, and I, I borrowed it from Gary Westcott's glimpses of the past page because he There's had more a nice than one bear because bears only have ten claws, right? And so the back <laughs> ones are smaller yeah. and the bigger ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's an item that has been repatriated to you, that bear claw necklace. Right. That if you're interested in seeing it, it's still in the casino white cloud uh, where mm -hmm. it's kept under um, security conditions. Um, and this is a nice example of some um, Iowa moccasins, beaded moccasins. Um, I, I do notice a lot of the pink beans. Um, is that is that something that was popular at a certain time period for, for the I Iowa? Mean, I mean, people who are into beadwork, they'll talk about greasy yellow, they'll talk about certain colors that were popular during time periods of manufacture, um, sizes of beads, all those things. Those are people who are into beadwork can really tell a lot about things based upon the colors, the types of beads, the styles. Um, I think this one is probably 1870s, 1880s, maybe. I don't, I, I am not as up on that as some, but um, is a really good example of uh, probably women's moccasins, I'm guessing, because of the bigger flap. Um, but nice, nice work. Very nice, beautiful stuff. And each of those, now remember with plants, sometimes you're looking from different points of view. Sometimes you're looking at full on a blossom. Sometimes it's a profile look at the plant, like a leaf. Whatever helps determine the characteristics of the plant so it's identifiable to the people who, who notice these things. Um, a lot of them medicinal plants, a lot of them um, sacred plants. Um, so that sort of thing happens too. Is there a way to identify Iowa beadwork? Like I think you had mentioned one time that there's like a one white line around it or sometimes there's two I've white heard, lines. I've heard that, that sometimes there's one white line or two white lines. Um, People, generally, most people that I know of, they can narrow it down to say, this is more Iowa or Oto, Missouri versus Omaha or one of the others. But um, I think it comes down to people who are really, and I think the older people who made these more frequently um, probably could have. But also these things were traded as gifts. So you mm -hmm. might make something that was an Osage or an Oto, and now end up in Iowa or Omaha hands too. These, though, these were either Iowa or, uh, and they're very close to Sack and Fox sometimes too, who were very united with us in many, many ways for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you also have marriage between the tribes. Right. So, you know, so what, what are you doing today uh, working to, I know you've, you mentioned that you're doing some language work and, and preserving culture. So Lance, what's going on today with the, the tribe? I think Greg can kind of um, chime in on this too, but you know, language is a, is a tricky thing. You know, um, language is something that you learn from your family growing up as your first language, right? So the first language of um, users of the IOA and even Oto and stuff, um, the, they, the first fluent speakers, the fluent speakers, they, in other words, I define that as somebody can talk in the language um, all day long and not have to break into English at all with another fluent speaker. That's how I define fluent. The last of those people who could do that all day long passed in the 1990s and they were in their 80s and 90s. Um, so the language has had a lot of materials from the missionaries, through Jim Good Tracks, through Oto Missouri a language program. I mean, I have some videos online. We've all made efforts to try to preserve the language, but a language is part of a worldview and there's an economic uh, element to it as well. Um, usually most um, traditional cultures, the women are the ones who transmit that language. And in our tribe, uh, it was kind of determined basically upon the way the boarding schools treated our people. They didn't want their kids beaten either. They didn't want their kids beat up and disregarded and made to feel small. So they didn't really pass on the language to the younger generations. And it was a way for mom and dad to talk and grandma and grandpa to talk without the kids knowing what they're talking about too. But the kids learn, it's just, but there's a difference. There's a different skill in producing the language versus hearing and understanding it. You guys who have studied language, you know, you might understand Spanish or French, but then having a conversation in it is a different skill entirely, a different skill level anyway. Um, so we have had, um, classes at various times, different people have taught it. 
But the fact is learning a language, especially for an adult, takes a lot of work and a lot of determination, a lot of time. Most people are not willing to do that, whoever they are, is it takes time and work. Um, you can make it fun, but some people don't think it's fun. So, um, and usually a lot of try, like people like the Hawaiians who brought a lot of their language back, they created like the language immersion programs and you need a fluent speaker to do that, an elder or something that can speak that language all the time and the kid absorbs that and they teach the kid. Um, we don't have any fluent speakers yet left. So at this point, it's mostly about language awareness, trying to learn some of the basic phrases, some of the words, um, some of the singing, things like that. I mean, we're just trying to keep it uh, alive, um, but it would take a real effort and commitment from tribes uh, 100% to have a hope of bringing it back. One of the interesting things I think is when you go to the reservation um, on some of your signs, they are in the Iowa language. That's the awareness part. I mean, it's just to remind people that we have a language, that this is what the language looks like. This is what it sounds like. Um, because people often think, would you speak a Sioux language? No, it's Sioux one, the way English is a Germanic language, but it is not German. You know, they're different. They have the same roots. They developed over the last thousand, 2000 years from the same roots, but they're not the same language. Iowa is not an Osage language. It's not Omaha. It's not Crow. It's not Hidatsa. All these languages are different. Just like English is not Nor you know, Swedish, it's not Norwegian, it's not you know, any of these languages, but they came from the same roots. Mm -hmm. And so you also have a cultural center there on the reservation, uh, community center, um, where, you know, you're trying to do some preservation of culture. We, um, it started primarily, Bajoje Washkanchi is what we call it. Bajoje is what we call ourselves. Um, ba, ba means snow, Joje means ashes or gray colored. Um, gray snow is uh, often the most common way that people interpret that. Um, and there's different stories about how that came to be too. Um, but the thing is, we wanted to, I've had where we've done, studied, um, we've made drums here, we've uh, made moccasins, we've um, done uh, introduction to power clothing, we've had language classes, we've had uh, where we actually read out loud, you know, our myths and our legends to each other you know, so we would keep it alive, you know. Um, right now, because of not only COVID, but because we have um, sensitive objects that we have to like take care of, it is more of an archival um, thing. But we are trying to find ways to um, revive that. We've had to even cancel our powwow this year because of COVID. Um, we've had to rethink a lot of this. Um, all I know is you just sometimes you gotta keep it on respirator, ventilator. Oh, geez, don't wanna do that, do we? Um, but anyway, we gotta keep our language alive as best we can, even if it's, um, whether it's like little kind of things like this, events, or whether it is writings, or whether it's during powwows or whatever. Um, lang just remember, language is just like culture. It doesn't, it's not static. Latin is a dead language because it didn't change. Well kind of did change into French and Italian and Spanish. So that's not exactly true either. Our language is a sacred thing. It is, um, it is one of the last things we have um, that is ours distinctly, makes us who we are instead of a pan-Indian kind of a group. And I always applaud and I always try to help anybody, whether it's to get exercises or speak um, with each other, just to make the attempts to keep it alive. You know, um, but this here, this is the Iowa community building built by the tribe uh, from local limestone. Um, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. We put it on that. Um, but it serves mainly as an archive and storage at this point. We are trying to make longer term plans. It's just and exactly an exhibit that at various times, a timeline to kind of show the context and some of the items here. Um, sometimes, uh, hopefully after this time, if people it's not open regularly because we don't have the staff for that. But if somebody wants to try to visit or whatever, we after the pandemic is over, I, I welcome that. You know, right now we're trying to avoid exposure to each other because we don't want 
to be responsible for that, you know? Sure. Yep. So you have a few other um, programs that you've um, started recently. I, and by recently, I'd say, what, in the last 10 years, maybe? Five years, even. Five years. Yeah. Um, so you have a regenerative art agriculture program. Um, and could, could you give us, I know at the Highland presentation, you talked a little bit about um, how that works with the partnership well, between the animals and the plants and... Well, you know, I mean, part of the whole um, acculturation assimilation process, um, trying to keep a part of who you are in the face of having to become something else economically. Um, we took on from the horse and the plow to growing instead of our native corn, beans and squash, to taking on crops like wheat and building orchards and stuff in the 1870s, 1880s. We've had to keep up with the, the market economy. And so as part of that, uh, originally we got into it with fur trade, right? Market economy, the world economy. Mm -hmm. Then it turned into farming agriculture since we didn't have access to beaver pelts and things like that. Um, and so we were also part of the industrial agriculture revolution, the green revolution, 1930s and 40s to feed the world, corn and soybeans rotation. That was the primary thing. And that's what people still kind of do here. Unfortunately, to make money at that anymore, you have to have a huge amount of acreage. You can't just do it in a small uh, acreage that we have. And so between that and watching the land slowly die from the um, application of chemicals and the water nitrate level going up, up and everything, we're going to be here for another thousand years, hopefully. We're not going to be here if we don't take care of it. So in the face of a lot of opposition, much of it even local, we've had to look at another way to approach to bring back the life of our land. And that means a regenerative approach. And that means integrating um, soil health, uh, long-term cover, um, kind of using cattle grazing the way buffalo were, where intensive short periods that you cycle through the fields. Um, so that's part of that regenerative agriculture that brings back the health of the land and be more of a focused micro markets on certain things and how are we going to survive here um part of that has been the approval of the industrial hemp program uh which we're this year's our first crop uh that we're working on that so and that will be focused into doing things like um, um hempcrete houses and um focused on uh, a new product line that we're coming out which is hemp based cigarettes things like that that we're doing but long term, the, the older than that, than that even, this started maybe five, six years ago, was the Iowa Bee Farm. And as part of that understanding, and you see that picture, that's me and a former vice chair, Alan Kelly, walking through some of the Nature Conservancy bluff lands, um, was the hope that by diversifying economically and bringing in pollinators and bringing in honey as a business, that maybe the chemical uh, pressure would kind of lower and we could try to try to heal our land back while making um, honey and stuff. Now we hit a really great event earlier, just a month or two ago, when one, uh, one of the tribal members um, helped our bee farm go viral and like we got 20,000 hits in one day. And so our honey operations really kind of been going up out the roof. Um, uh, lately. Uh, so we're dealing with the bee farm. We're dealing, and you can go online and, and look at that website and order our highway honey locally. Um, you can, uh, we're doing products for industrial hemp. We're developing that this year. But we're also, as you can see, two other things that are kind of cool to talk about briefly. Uh, I know we're going, going long, but one is the, we're always been trying to buy our land back. We lost 90% of it. Um, sometimes we, you know, through the casino, we were able to get some money back. We have a small casino, it's rural, it doesn't make the money some of the larger casinos make, but we try to buy land back to, for the tribe uh, whenever we can, when it comes up for sale. Um, we try to also um, bring back the land through deals like the Nature Conservancy donated some of its land back to us. Um, the land that we're walking through is some of that kind of land like that. Um, because it was designed for conservation. 
It is what Nebraska calls a biologically unique landscape with a lot of endangered species, threatened species, species that are quite rare. And so we're trying to bring our land back on that level too. Um, and um, we're kind of linked with Indian Cave State Park and across the river, all these places, we're like a little touchstone of what um, the original land was like. Um, and it's been too rough, so it hasn't been developed, but some places are getting really developed. So that's returning to the lost reservation land. And finally, the Iowa Tribal National Park, the, the, um, the Iowa Tribal National Park was designated this year. It's only the second one in the United States by that name. The first one was just a few years ago up in Red Cliff Band. I think it's called Frog Bay. And I think they had like 300 acres and ours is gonna be well over that. Um, we have two units right now. We have the Leary site, which is um, over 150 or so acres um, of that, of that um, 1200 to 1400 a village site along with um, mounds. And then the other part, and so that's kind of the cultural side. And then we have the um, natural side, which is the nature conservancy lands that we're taking on and trying to manage it. That's going to be part of a, a larger vision to try to educate people not only about our history um, across the landscape, but also to bring health back to the land in a culturally appropriate way that helps our people. Thank you, Lance, for sharing all of that. And, and I hope our listeners feel the same way that I do. It certainly gives me a lot of hope. Um, I think you have a lot of vision for moving um, forward in sustainable ways. And I, and I think these are just amazing programs. And so I, I know it's a lot of work, um, but it's also so important. And I think it, it gives us a vision of a way to move forward um, sustainably as well. So thank you. Uh, we're kind of low on time. So we're going to open it up for questions. Um, I have a couple questions that I, I thought I'd throw out there. Um, we have the recent Oklahoma land ownership ruling from the Supreme Court. Um, is that going to have any potential on um, Iowa tribe? You know, a lot of people either worry or are glad about it. But if you look at the case itself, it was one of jurisdiction per a particular tribe, I think it was the Creeks um, down in Oklahoma. And it was something that a little T hadn't been crossed and a dot hadn't been made on, on the finalizing some land deals there. So they found a loophole and they're trying to use that loophole to deal with a legal case that they were dealing with uh, regarding jurisdiction. Uh, I think it's so particular, it, it gives people hope, but I think it's so particular to that tribe situation. I don't know what kind of impact it will have, but I'll leave it to the lawyers to figure that one out. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs, of course, just recently issued a, a broad statement um, about the use of the Chiefs mascot. And um, here locally, the Savannah Savages have been having a lot of conversations. Um, the Washington football team has officially changed its name. Um, it's it's a lot of things have been changing recently. Do you have any thoughts on that or? It's, it's a tricky one because um, the thing is from a cultural point of view, um, objectification of any people or any, any race, any, any sex, any, anything like that, that just, that just harms people and it continues uh, that kind of path of uh, that's destroying the world the way it is. Um, you know, we, we made an effort to, uh, we had a creek here that people know as Squaw Creek, but, um, but originally before that, during the treaty, it was called Nolan's Creek. So that was easy enough. When I, when I posted, uh, when we were putting up those sign names, right? Uh, I thought, oh, we don't, we don't, that squaw is not a word that we have. We didn't use that. Um, some of our older people, um, you know, they inherited some of it. So they're kind of used to that term and you don't see it necessarily as a bad thing. But, you know, talking about colonization of the mind, right? So a lot of us are still colonized. I, I myself, in a lot of ways, still, you know, I think of an older, older kind of a sensibility, but younger people are leading us in a different direction and younger people are the future and they see things that we need to see as well. Um, I hope we kind of respect each other. With this thing, question about uh, any kind of names, whether it's things like Squaw Creek, we're changing that name up in Iowa too. Uh, name and they're going to honor us by calling it Iowa Creek is the last thing I heard. But then across the river there, um, uh, Les Bluffs 
uh, was called Squaw Creek. And a lot of the people locally there were very invested in that name. And that's, they didn't see it was wrong or whatever. But the problem is, is that, you know, um, when you talk to somebody, if you're trying to help them out, um, if they don't feel like it's an honor, if I call you uh, a name, uh, like, hey, Puff, hey, Puffy, or something like that. And, you know, maybe it's no big deal to you, to me, but maybe, you know, you had uh, asthma as a kid and maybe you don't really like that name. Maybe it kind of makes you feel bad. It makes you feel like, well, why are you calling me Puffy for? I had asthma, you dick. But anyway, <laughs> anyway so, so I'm, I guess I'm tired. So I'm a little getting less. <laughs> That's okay. But the um, thing is, as far as masks, it's, what I always tell people is this. Our people feel very differently. Some people just, they love the Chiefs. Some people, it pisses them off. For me, I say, call me anything you want to, but just give me back the lamb. That's the condition. If you want to call me Puffy, call me the Puffy, but give me back the lamb first. <laughs> I think it, I just want to chime in here. I think it's, um, there's a, a greater awareness is coming up about the way things have been and how it's hurt people, how names like Lance is talking about, how they've hurt people. And, and I think so now there's a greater public knowledge is starting to come around about how we, we need to be more careful. You know, we're starting to understand colonization better. People are writing more about it. It's filtering into the popular culture more. Um, you know, so it, it comes through with things like the highways, you know, and what you guys are doing on the reservation. I think it's exciting that you're exerting some sovereignty over your land, over the way you eat, the way you farm and things like that. And it's, and you see this happening all over the country. So I think it's a really exciting time. Attitudes are changing. People are starting to realize you know, some of the damage that has been done over the last few hundred years. So, and, and there's a, a, a process to try to, to uh, understand that more and then to move on with it. So. Let me think about it. I mean, if you think about it, um, I know people, my grandmother, uh, on the one hand, we called, when I was a little kid, fry bread, we called it squaw bread. That's yeah. what we called it. You know, that's why I grew up thinking it was and it was only my teens in the 70s that I was corrected about that um but my grandma you call her something like squall or something she'd like yeah. take your head off so it's different if you grew up when you're a kid and you're yeah. saying you're hearing somebody say yeah you're nothing but a dirty so-and-so you're not going to like that name it's going to make you feel bad and not like that person right so if you're saying yeah dirty savage uh, you're a dirty red skin or whatever why is that an honor how is that an honor Hey, chief, how is that an honor if you're saying it in that kind of way? So, you know, people feel differently. Everybody's got their own opinions. I know this, even in our political situation now, you're not going to argue people out of the way they feel. That's fine. But at least try to understand how I feel. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for that. Um, and we did have one question um, from the group, and, and that was, are there any family IDs on the floral vests? Do you know who those particular vests, what so, family? The family yeah. usually does. The family's like, well, that's a so-and-so family design. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with songs and powwow songs. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of them kind of come into general use. But originally, if you want to be really correct, and the older people will say that, certain songs belong to certain families. And only that family can use that song or pass it on to another one for whatever reasons they have to. But, um, but people are just kind of looking for inspiration. They're kind of using what they hear. And it's the same thing with, with these designs. You, you can look at things, you can look at these designs and get the idea of how they're made and get the inspiration from the plants and see how people would kind of construct it. Then come up with your own design. Don't copy somebody else's design. You don't know what it means. You don't necessarily have the right to do that. But if you look at the insp as an inspiration and say, you know what, this flower kind of looks like this if you hold it on the side and you kind of abstract it, then that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. Nice closing thoughts, guys. Go for it, Greg. Okay. <laughs> well, I think uh, just to repeat what I just said, I think it's really an exciting time, um, you know, both 
well, from my point of view, it's really an exciting time to be researching and writing about native history in Missouri and about Iowa's and, and to see culture coming around, like I said, a greater understanding of some of the ways that we've hurt people and maybe some of the ways that might be redressed uh, you know, in the future, how we might move on. And it's also just exciting to see a lot of the young people taking up traditions, like even in the Iowa nation, there's a lot of young people now are picking it up, working with the language, working with the arts, you know, doing their own twist on it and things like that. And so I, I, I'm, I'm mostly optimistic about the future. I think it's exciting. I would, um, I would just like to add, um, we're always interested in people that have um, bits and pieces of the puzzle of our history mm -hmm. and our, our ways, our land and everything. You, each of you may know a little bit of something that we don't have anymore because our culture was a complete puzzle that somebody knocked off the table and we're looking for the pieces all the time. Um, there's a really good book um, about... Um, there are no, where are all, all the real Indians are dead and other 20 other myths or something like that. That's how it goes. That gives you a list of some of the common misconceptions people mm -hmm. have about Indian people. And of course, one of them often is, um, how come you guys don't ride horseback? How come you guys don't use tomahawk? How come you guys don't hunt buffalo? How come you, Lance, you look so pale? What's the deal yeah. there? Well, if you know our history, you will know that, say, for example, Indian corn you look speckled Indian corn, you have a blue kernel, you have a red one, you have a yellow one, you have a white one. And that's the thing. It's the same year of corn with the same people, but some of our kernels are colored a little bit differently. Very nice. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jackie, for helping organize this. I, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts or you're good, but um, Lance and Greg, I learned a lot and it was very thorough and if anyone else has any questions, we can stay on for a few more minutes. But other than that, um, I, I really appreciate everybody joining us today. And um, you can find out about this and other St. Joseph Museum events at our website, stjosephmuseum.org. Uh, we would love to have you as a member of the museum if you're interested. And um, we'll try to work to keep bringing great programs to you um, and keep doing the research that we do, working with tribes like the Iowa to understand our collection and our history better. And so thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to stick around. Thank you. Thanks. And, and th thanks for the invitation, yeah.